thank you for joining us for the, jo excuse me, thank you for joining the Center for Disability Empowerment's Emergency Readiness Series. My name is Marley Sade, and I am your project manager. I am a manual wheelchair user with brown hair and brown eyes. I am wearing a black tank top with a teal sweater. My pronouns are she and her. Joining us today is a representative from the Ohio Pharmacist Association, Martha Morton. Good morning, Martha. Good morning. My name is Martha Morton. Thank you very much, Marley. I'm happy to be here. I am Martha Morton. I am a pharmacy student. I am wearing a gray sweater with a blue necklace. I have brown hair and blue eyes. And I'm excited to be here. My pre-noun is she, her. All Wonderful. right. Can you tell us a little bit about your background before we get started with the presentation? Yes, ma'am. And I will be also getting a little more into that in the next slide. But I am a phar pharmacy student at Cedarville University. This is my last year. I am within my seventh year of pharmacy school, very ready to graduate. I'm working alongside Amy, who is also in this meeting today. She is my preceptor, and we are with the Ohio Pharmacists Association. As an office, we tend to provide continued education as well as legislation in regards to the pharmacy field. Wonderful, thank you. And with that, um, go ahead and get started, please. So this first slide is what we're going to be talking about today, and that is emergency preparedness and safe medicine management practices. As I said before, I'm from the Ohio Pharmacists Association as a pharmacy intern, and my name is Martha Morton. I do wanna give a very short disclaimer, and that is just that this presentation is not all inclusive, but it will give a great idea of what should be done to prepare for an emergency, specifically in medicine management. All right, let's get started. So this next slide, I already talked briefly about me, but I am a PharmD candidate for 2021. And what that means is my hope is that I will become a licensed pharmacist within the next year, within the year of 2021. I'm graduating in May of 2021, and then we'll pursue that licensure through completion of an exam and then passing it. I already said I'm here with the Ohio Pharmacists Association, but I do want to talk briefly about the pharmacy um, field as a whole. Pharmacists at this time, whenever they are becoming licensed, have already completed a six to eight year program and have received a PharmD graduation upon graduation. They also have to complete 40 hours of continued education every two years after they have become a licensed pharmacist. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started and we'll start talking about what we're here for today. So why are we here? So first I'm going to talk very briefly about the most common disasters in the local region and then identify the problems that we face when in the state of emergency, specifically in regards to medicine management. Then I'm going to talk through the appropriate steps of preparation for safe medicine management for an emergency situation, and then outline the best practices while we are in emergency. And my hope is after this presentation, you will be able to design your own personal emergency medical plan we will not be having time specifically to do this today, but my hope is, is that after all of the information and resources that I have provided for you, that you will be able to do it on your own. And you will be provided these slides after the fact so that you can go through these slides a lot slower than what I am going to be talking through today. So these are just some common natural disasters that we have in the state of Ohio. I'm sure you are very familiar with these. I am actually not a born resident of the state of Ohio. I am from North Carolina. So I have learned about these in my last seven years here at pharmacy school. These common natural disasters include severe rainstorms, flooding, extreme cold weather, power outages, tornadoes, snowstorms, and extreme heat. We had a severe rainstorm a couple of days ago, so we're very familiar with that. One common denominator of these natural disasters that I've noted is water. 
that's not important, but it's just something I thought I would mention when looking at these. So the COVID-19 pandemic is a more familiar emergency that we are actually facing right now. It tends to be less common that we are faced with some huge pandemic like COVID-19, but it's more regular for us to face general airborne diseases like influenza. And that's something to keep in mind whenever you're being prepared for emergencies. I know that the COVID-19 pandemic is not something that we would have ever thought would happen, but it is amongst us. So we can continue to prepare and keep our information that we'll be talking about in a little bit so that we do have safe medicine management. Okay. So what can we do to prepare for an emergency? We've already talked about a few of the common natural disasters in Ohio, as well as the state of emergency that we are currently in. So what we, can we do to prepare for an emergency before it happens? So this is a slide, it's got a lot of information on it, but I'm gonna talk through every single part of it. So in preparation for an emergency, it is important to keep a list of things that are are handy. So you need to keep these lists and this information handy either in a place that you carry with you whenever you leave the home, if you are leaving the home during the COVID-19 pandemic or whenever, as well as a place that's very easily accessible in the home, like the kitchen and a place where people know. So the first list that I have here is the medicine list. And whenever you make a medicine list, this involves the actual name of the medicine, as well as the dosage that you are currently taking, how you take it, as well as the name of the physician. This is not an all-inclusive list. You could also include why you are taking it. I know for those of you that are taking a medicine, taking at least 20 medicines, I definitely would be confused if I had two medicines that looked very, very similar. So you could also put in this list what you are taking it for, and that would be beneficial for whenever you are going to your medicine cabinet and trying to figure out what medicine and when you should be taking it. A physician list as well. So this is important for whenever you are in emergency, it's very important to know what your physician's name is as well as how to get in contact with them. So if you needed to go to the doctor or if you needed to get into contact with them during an emergency, it's important to have this list before that time so that you could have ease in contact. As well as a pharmacy list. I know a lot of people have to fill at two different pharmacies because one of their pharmacies may not have the special, specialty magic medication or medicine that um, the, uh, and then their other pharmacy has all their other medicines. So having a name of the pharmacy as well as the address and the contact information for this pharmacy would be very beneficial so that if someone needed to pick up your medicines for you, they could very easily. As well as this last list is a contact list. So this list is just a list of people that have either been taking care of you as a caregiver or a family member. This can also include friends or neighbors that have come by and they will be checking on you. So in this list, please include their relation to you as well as your phone num their phone number and their address so that if anything were to happen, they'd be easily contacted either by an emergency caregiver um, like an EMS worker or in the hospital or if somebody um, comes in contact with you in an emergency situation, they can contact these people. And last but not least, insurance information. We all know that whenever it comes to picking up medicines, it's very hard <laughs> to go through this process if you don't have any insurance information on hand. So it's important to keep your insurance card on hand whenever you leave the house, especially whenever you're going to be filling your medicines as well as keeping a photocopy or a scan of the card somewhere else that you remember that it is. This next slide is just a very short quote from Maya Angelou. And it says, hoping for the best, prepared for the worst and unsurprised by anything in between. 
And that's what my hope this presentation can do for you, that it can help you prepare for the worst. And sometimes even whenever we are prepared for the worst, we will be surprised by it, but we'll at least be prepared. So I gave you a lot of lists of information, and now I'm going to discuss where you should store this information. I talked about this briefly whenever we talked about the list, but I'm gonna talk about it in more detail here. So where should you store this information? First of all, it's very important that you store it somewhere where it's easily accessible by you as well as a caretaker. And whenever you have a caretaker in the home or if you have a family member that is taking care of you, make sure that they know exactly where this information is going to be also. The next question is physically or digitally? So I do not personally have a preference and I'm not going to recommend one of these ways over the other, but physically means keeping an actual paper list of, these, of this information that we talked about before. And then digitally means either in your phone, through an app, or on your computer. Today I'm going to be talking in more detail about the digital options for storage because the physical option is pretty um, easy to just print out and have or have written on a piece of paper. But one more very important point that I want to make is this information needs to stay updated. If you have a list of medicines, if you have a list of doctors and none of them are actually true to you now, it's not gonna help anyone. And it's not gonna help you whenever you're coming back to this information for questions. So just keep in mind, it's very important to keep this information updated. So this next slide has a couple of apps that I have gone through and looked at. And these are some options for digital storage of the information that we talked about before. And just to review, this information that we talked about was medicine list, physician list, pharmacy list, as well as your um, contact list. So first here we have the iPhone health app. So this app, we'll talk in a little bit more um, actually, all of these apps we're going to talk about in very much detail in the next few slides, but here is a bigger visual representation of them. The iPhone Health app is here on the left. The My Meds app is in the middle here. The MediSafe Meds and Peels Reminder app, also in the middle. And then the Epic My Chart app. Some of these apps may actually be very familiar to you, and if they are, that's awesome. I am going to be talking about them in a little more detail today. So if you are familiar with them, you can check out for a second, um, but we are going to be talking about them. I do, before we move on, want to do a disclaimer that I am not supporting one app or over one of these apps over another, nor am I financially connected to any of the app manufacturers and nor is the Ohio Pharmacists Association. So with that in mind, we'll go ahead and move through and I do wanna say that each of these apps are initially free. They provide the resources that I'm going to be talking about today free of charge, but they do have some upgrade options for an extra fee that I will not be talking about today. So this first app is the iPhone Health app. That was the one that we saw on the, the left. And you can see up here on the right, there is actually an icon with a heart in the middle. So on this slide, we have the iPhone health app opened up on the phone and it has a list of health records. And this can include your allergies, your clinical vitals. And what a clinical vital is, is your heart rate, your blood pressure, your respiratory rate and things like that. Your conditions, so that would be like hypertension or high blood sugar, immunizations, like the flu vaccine or the um, COVID-19 vaccine, if we get that passed in the next few months, um, as well as lab results. So this could be your blood sugar results or many other ones. And then your medicines, which they call medications in this app. 
So since I am a pharmacist, I'm going to be going through the medications aspects of each one of these apps instead of any of the others, but you definitely can take time and explore through these apps to see what they offer in the other aspects of your health records. So as you can see here, I clicked on medications and from there it says access your records, connect to your provider to see your health records and get updates when there's a new entry. So you press get started from there and then you can search for your healthcare provider. And when I say your healthcare provider, I mean your physician or your primary care doctor. And if your primary care doctor's um, health system is included in this app, you can click on it. And then from there, it will cross over and there will be, there will be interconnectability between your phone app and then what your doctor is updating at the actual site. So this is really cool because if you want to stay updated based off of the information your doctor has, that's a really cool aspect of this app. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move forward to the next app. And that is called the My Meds app. So this app is actually solely a medication pharmacy, doctor, allergy, and dependent list app. It does not have any connections to your doctor at all. So if somebody wants a more simple, very straightforward app that has nothing to do with connecting to your doctor, this is the app for you. So this app, I clicked for this um, visual representation, I clicked add medication. And from there, I have the add medication. It has information that you can list. And this includes the medication that you are taking, the reason why you're taking it, how many you are taking when you do take it, and how often. They also have the ability to put in the quantity, the number of refills, the start date, so when you should start taking the medication, and then the end date, when, the, when that actual fill should be out. Special instructions. So this would include if you need to put it in the refrigerator in between uses, or if it should be taken um, intranasally, which means up the nose, or any special instructions for your medications. The prescribing doctor would specifically be the doctor that wrote the script for the medication and the pharmacy where you filled this medicine. The next app is called MediSafe. And this app is pretty cool. It's very different from the last two we talked about as well. So what you do here is you, this is just regarding medicine. It does not have any of the options for the other list that we talked about before. So you would have to store that information separately. This is more of a reminder app for you to make sure that you know when you're supposed to be taking your medic medicines. So here we start by clicking add your med. And then you see that it says add medicine up top. You type in the medication that you're going to be taking. So I, for example, typed in lisinopril, which is a blood pressure medication. And I clicked one of these. So it also has a very nice picture of what your medicine looks like. So you can click the one that it looks like as well as the strength that you are taking. As you can see here, there all of these three medicines are the same strength, but they look very different. So it'd be very, I would be very careful to make sure that you click the right one. Then for the frequency, that means how often are you taking it? I put every day and then how many times a day, once a day. Then you can actually set the time and the dose. So the time that I set just for if you wanted to take the medicine when you were waking up in the morning, I put 8 a.m. and I'm going to take one pill. You can put a start date as well as an end date. And this app will actually, if you want this, it doesn't have to do this, but if you want it to, can actually send you reminders so that you make sure that you will be taking the medicine on time. It also has an option to incorporate your RX number 
So that's your script number. Whenever you receive your medicine, it has a script number. And I'll show you a picture of an actual label in a little bit, and we can talk about that, as well as the amount of pills that you have in your bottle, and then a refill reminder. So this app can tell you when to pick up your medicines, when it's going to be running out soon, which I find very helpful. This next app is the one that I was most fam familiar with before looking into these a little further. And this is the Epic MyChart app. So this app is actually another one of those apps that will connect you to your physician and it will show you all of your files within the physician, under the physician, and show exactly what um, was discussed whenever you were at the doctor. So in order to do, do this, whenever you open the app, it asks you to select an organization. Specifically, where do you receive your health care? So I searched the state of Ohio, and then it gave me a list of all of the different providers that are on the app. So I chose Premier Health because that is in the area of Dayton, which is where I am, <clears throat> excuse me, I am staying at the moment. So I went ahead and put Premier Health and then from there asked for a little bit more information so that it can go ahead and put everything. It's trying to make sure that you are actually the person that is going to the office. So you do have to put in a couple of personal information like your my chart activation code, as well as your social security number and date of birth so that they make sure that you are the actual patient that they are connecting you with. So this next slide is specifically about some physical preparation for an emergency. I imagine throughout the last few weeks, whenever you were having discussions about things, you probably heard a lot about having an emergency health care kit and being prepared in that sense. I'm not gonna talk in too much detail about this today, but I will be talking about just very briefly what would be a good idea to keep in this healthcare kit and specifics to um, your medicines. But here are a couple of examples that are not medicine related that you can include in this healthcare kit. And that includes a battery operated radio, a flashlight, extra batteries that are needed for your personal medical equipment. So if you have a pump that needs to be kept up, up and running and you need extra batteries in case that you can't go out to buy any more batteries, it would be important to keep extra batteries and keep them up to date in this kit. A signaling device. So if there was a situation there where there was a natural disaster and you're trapped somewhere, a signaling device like loud whistle, horn or bell would be good so that people can hear you, as well as a first aid kit. So that would include some like topical creams for pain, as well as a neosporin, some band-aids, as well as some other things that you would keep in a just normal first aid kit. Now, in more detail, I do want to talk about non-prescription medicines, as well as some other medicines that you would be keeping in this kit. So, specific to non-prescription medicines, whenever you are keeping these medicines in this healthcare kit, it is just as important to keep them up to date. I know for me, whenever I was growing up, my parents kept a first aid kit, and we would not pull it out for years and everything in it was expired by the time we actually needed to use it. Um, in order to be productive and not reactive to one of these situations, please make sure that these non-prescription medicines, and that includes something like ibuprofen, some of your creams that you get from the store that are very much needed but don't need a prescription, um, keep these up to date so that whenever you need this emergency health care kit, you can actually use it as well as appropriate storage containers for these medicines. So I personally think that if you have a healthcare kit and it's not going to be water resistant, it's not going to help you very much. Um, because if there's a flood or um, any form of 
problem with water, like we talked about before, it is the common denom denominator of the natural disasters that we talked about today. It's not going to help you very much if the medicines are completely degraded and messed up. It's not going to help you. So one other thing that I do want to say, and this might not be kept in your emergency health care kit, is don't let your prescription medicines run out. In a situation where there is potentially a either a storm coming or if there's a pandemic that's present, don't let your prescription medicines run out to the extent that you feel like you're unsafe to go out to get them, especially if they're essential medicines. All right, so I'm going to actually go ahead and open up the floor for questions. And this is the time that you guys can go ahead and ask whatever you, um, questions you have about the apps, about any of the information we have covered so far. I don't see any questions right now. Marley, did you have any questions? I do not. However, I have a tip. Okay. If that's all right. Yes. I know that a lot of us have those prescription medications that they're regulated, so it's hard to potentially get them refilled if you have them damaged or lost or stolen. Yes. One of the things that I like to do is if I miss a dose of my medication, I don't, I don't double up. I just put that dose as part of a backup supply in case I do need, um, do, do need it and run out of the regular monthly supplies that I have. So that's one thing that I've learned to do over the years when it comes to those prescription meds that are pretty regulated. I believe we have a question. Uh, yes. In the chat, Julie stated, I have both an OSU MyChart and an Ohio Health MyChart present and presence and wonder if the MyChart app you mentioned is related to these two, OSU MyChart and Ohio Health MyChart. I like the MyChart groups, but don't have an app yet for them. Awesome. And her name was again? Julie. Julie. Very good question, Julie. Um, yes, this is connected with MyChart. Um, whenever you go into the physician or if you have any questions, um, you can call a nurse and they can get you set up with MyChart um, because they know the information that should be included. But the app is connected with those my chart OSU as well as the Ohio Health. Yes. And thanks, Marley, for your tip. Of course. Um, it's one thing that I've learned over the years because I do have prescription meds. And sometimes in, in an emergency, you do have to find ways to work around it, the predicament of not having your meds. So, does um, anybody go ahead, Jamie? Sorry. No, you're fine. I was going to share a no-no that I shared during our practice session. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, back when I was between the ages of 11 to 13, I was having seizures. Um, I had probably about seven or eight grand mal seizures in that time frame. And so I was on a variety of different um, medications over that time period. And at one point I was on one that was a capsule, uh, time release capsule um, medication. And I had to take two pills a day, but I was still very much struggling with swallowing pills. Didn't know that I could just talk to my doctor about that and maybe get a switch in the form that the medication came in. So a big no-no that I committed is I would open the capsules and take what's inside directly. Um, and at one point this caused a bit of an overdose kind of, I guess you could say. Uh, one time I had dropped one of the pills I had to take. So I took a little bit of a third pill and ended up being woozy all that day. Um, so I, I learned the hard way to ask people that are smarter than you how to properly take the medication. So just thought I'd share that no-no story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. And we are not smarter than you. We just have studied it for so long. 
<laughs> that is interesting, though. I did not know that you could find other forms or methods if you have a, a difficulty with swallowing different pills. Yes. Yeah, so I know a lot of medicines that are newer, you might not potentially be able to switch over very easily. But for most of the medicines that have been around for years, we do have other options. Wonderful. Good to and know. there are a lot of medicines that are specifically made in formulations for kids because kids cannot swallow. And I know of a lot of adults that still take the liquid formulations of medicines. Can I just say, this makes me kind of angry to have this knowledge now, being 30 years old now, and I can swallow pills now. And I wish I would have known this a really long time ago. <laughs> it's one of those things where you don't know what you don't know, right? Exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jamie. Now you know. <laughs> Thanks. A little too late. No, I'm just kidding. Not your fault at all. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, though. Some I have heard of people who break it, break their pills, or smash them into powders. Um, and then there are individual or caretakers who work with individuals with mental health disorders. I was. I was giving my mother her medications when um, I was a child and my mom is, was undiagnosed as schizophrenic for a long time and she was put on different types of medications. And um, one of the things I was told to do is smash her meds and put it in her food or her drink. Um, but you know what? She was much smarter than I was at 13 years old. She knew what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but those were just things that I didn't, I, I would do to help her take her meds. And now I learned that those are not the good, the smart ways to do it for anyone, but that's what I was told to do back then. So. Right. And there are certain medicines that if your doctor specifically tells you to crush them and put them in applesauce or something, it is appropriate. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail in a little bit as well when we talk about the proper use of medicines. Wonderful, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Do you guys have any more questions before we continue? Um, I don't see any in the chat. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started back and we will have another time for questions. So don't worry if you have questions, we will have another time to ask. Okay, so this next section is how can I manage my medicines? So this is irrespective of an emergency. This is the everyday, how can I manage my medicines? So as Marley and Jamie touched on, um, medicine management and safety is very important, specifically whenever it comes to proper use. So we will talk, be talking a little more in detail of what we were talking about before, secure storage of the medicines, as well as appropriate disposal of expires, expired and unused medicines. So here's a slide about proper use. So I'm sure you are very familiar that there is a difference between prescription medicines and non-prescription medicines. But just for those that may not be completely familiar with the difference, I am going to cover it today because it is important for some talk, talking points that we're going to have. So a prescription medicine is prescribed by a physician or a doctor, and it's ordered for a specific person for a specific diagnosis. So it is not one size fits all, rather it has been prescribed specifically for you. And this medicine is dispensed by the pharmacy. On the other side, there is non-prescription medicines. And this does not require a prescription. It may be taken by multiple people for the same intended use. So an example for this may be um, some Pepto-Bismol for um, if you're having an upset stomach 
or um, some ibuprofen if you're having some pain. These bottles, if they're not written, if there's not a prescription written for them, can be taken by multiple people. They can also be found on shelves in grocery stores. And one point that I do want to make here is though we don't often think of supplements, vitamins, minerals, as well as other herbal remedies as medicines, they very well are because they are doing very a lot of the things that medicines are doing. And we have to think of them in the same manner to realize that herbal remedies can also cause some of the side effects that medicines can. So please do keep that in mind. I am not going to do a comparison of your prescription versus non-prescription herbal remedies, but I am just going to mention that there are some risks involved with taking non-prescription herbal, rem herbal remedies as well. So this is what we're going to get into, which is the proper use. So I just want to specifically say, whenever you are taking your prescription medicines, always read the entire label every time you take it. Whenever I am sitting down to counsel a patient, I have heard many times, um, I did not know that my doctor changed my prescription. I did not know that I was supposed to be taking two pills instead of one twice a day. Uh, I read it as one pill twice a day. So if you read the entire label every time you take it, I am sure that you will catch the mistake that maybe you read and misunderstood the first time. Another very important point for reading the entire label every time is make sure that you're looking at it in a well-lit room. I know whenever my, I was little, my grandparents would take medicines in the morning in a very dark room. And I always wondered how they knew what medicine they were taking. They very well could have mistaken one for the other. And that is just a risk that we should not be taking when taking our medicines because they are supposed to be helping us to get better. So when we're looking at this label, what exactly should we be checking for? So this includes the directions. So the quantity, the amount you should be taking, and then the frequency, how often you should be taking it. What is it for? So is it for pain? Is it for an infection? It'll tell you. Um, side effects. So some of the medicine labels will actually include on the side in a little bar, what side effects you should be looking out for and sometimes how you can remedy these. Some precautions. So there are some medicines that you should be taking with food and some medicines that you should be taking on an empty stomach. That's an example of a precaution, as well as some ingredients. I know there are some patients that have, or people that have uh, allergies to specific in ingredients of medicines. And there are two very similar medicines with one having the ingredient that you're allergic to and one that does not. So that's just something to keep in mind. And if you see that an ingredient in your medicine that you are allergic to, let your doctor know before you take it. Okay. Another thing like Jamie was talking about before is do not crush or split your medicines unless your doctor has prescribed it in a way um, and telling you to do that. There are some formulations of medicines that are meant to be very, very delayed release. And if you were, and whenever I say delayed release, once it's in your body, it continues to work very, very slowly. If you were to crush the medicine, then you would get all the effects at once and it very well could cause a major problem, especially in some of those medicines where like, um, a um, medicine for a um, either a psych med or one of those pain medicines, you could actually very well, like Jamie said, overdose on the medicine if you were to crush or split it because you would be getting the drug all at once. Another thing that is very important is taking your medicines out of the sight of children. And we'll talk in more detail about this later 
but it is very important to take your medicines out of the sight of children. As you know, they are very, um, children want to be like us. And we'll touch on that a little bit further in a little bit. So this is a very, um, there's a lot on this slide and I don't wanna overwhelm you with it, but this is an example of a medicine label. And I do want to note that these medicine labels have the contact information for your pharmacy that you are filling, excuse me, as well as the information about your doctor. So if you have a question about your medication or your medicine, you have two contacts of reference right on the medicine label. You can call the pharmacy and talk to the pharmacist about it as they did fill your medicine and they had to take the time to put to look through um, your prescriptions so they know about your medicine, as well as talking to your doctor as they wrote you this prescription and they know about it. One more thing that I wanna show you here is that every one of the medicine labels have an expiration. So keep that in mind, especially if you are planning to maybe keep one of those extras that you missed um, behind, make sure that you know the expiration date as this date is meant to tell you when the medication or medicine is no longer working. So it's not going to give you the full effects of what it's supposed to do. And I know Marley had mentioned a very good tip for medicines where you are, um, you're able to save that medicine for later on. Um, that's another one of those things where it's not all size fits all. If it's a medicine where they recommend that you not double up on doses, please do save it for another time, especially if you um, miss a dose later on. Um, but there are some medicines that they recommend you take it as soon as possible. And that's a good ask for your doctor or for your pharmacist if you are worried about missing your dose. The reason why I mentioned that is I know there are a lot of birth control medicines as well as some oncology medicines, and that means cancer medicines, that they actually recommend that you double up on doses instead of saving it as that would help you with the effects of the medicine. Thank you again for that, Marley. All right. Thank you for elaborating and clarifying that process for us. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we are going to talk about why we do not take medicines in front of children. And I know my parents have always taken medicines in front of me and I have never had a problem. And I know historically, um, it's probably not been something that's much talked about. But now we are realizing that a lot of children, well, we know that children are curious. And we know that they like to mimic the actions of adults, but we are finding that these mimicking of the actions of adults are actually including them trying to take your medicines, especially whenever they are left unattended. Another point that I wanna make is medicine looks like candy to children. They really can't tell the difference. And I did wanna depict this in a picture here on the right. These. These medicines and these candies, when I look at this picture, I really can't tell the difference between all of them. They look very similar. So that's just something to keep in mind whenever you're taking your medicine to make sure that you're not taking it in front of children as they might misconstrue the situation or misunderstand and think that um, you're taking a candy and never call your medicine candy because that just increases the interest in taking medicine. Okay, these are a couple of statistics that I have found when looking through this information on kids taking medicines whenever they were unsupervised. So this first one says 60,000 ER visits annually due to unsupervised ingestion of medicines by children less than 12 years old. So these are actually kiddos who were so sick to the point that they had to go to the ER due to taking a medicine that was not meant for them. 
This next statistic is 9,000 children were exposed to prescription opioid medicines between 2003 and 2006. I know this is a little dated, but this is the information that I was able to find. And I thought it was still very, um, it's very heavy to know that 9,000 children were exposed to prescription opioid medicines at that time. As these medicines are very, it's very strict how these medicines are dispensed as well as how they are handled. Uh, it's very important to know that these medicines are being taken by the correct person. So hearing that 9,000 children in these three years received prescription opioid medicines wrong is, it's heavy. And all of these uses by these children were avoidable uses. If the parent or the caregiver or the grandparent had not left the medicine available for the child to reach it or had not been taking the medicine in front of them, they wouldn't be taking these um, medicines unsupervised. It's just, just something to keep in mind. So I did want to identify when it was appropriate to call poison control versus when it's appropriate to call 911. So the poison control is a set of experts that are meant to help you whenever you think that somebody, whether it be a child, an adult, a pet, has ingested a very poisonous amount of medicines. They provide free expert advice on all poisoning situations. This also includes if you think that a child or a pet has drunk, um, drank something that is potentially sitting around that's not meant to be ingested. This includes things that are not medicines. Um, you can call this number. The poison helpline will also give follow-up calls after the incident to ensure that the person that was poisoned or the pet that was poisoned has recovered. They'll follow you through the whole way. Now, a circumstance where you would not call the poison helpline, but rather call 911 is if the patient is collapsed, not breathing, unconscious, or seizing. This is a situation when you need an emergency response team pronto. You need them to come and help you right away. So that's when you can call 911. I imagine it wouldn't hurt for you to have the poison helpline in case um, you needed to help while waiting for the emergency response team. But it's very important if you have a um, kiddo or an adult or a pet that has collapsed, is not breathing, unconscious or seizing, to call 911. I did want to take a moment just for you guys to go ahead and put this poison helpline, either write it down or put it in your phone. So I'm just going to take a moment for you to go ahead and note this phone number so that whenever you need it, you'll have it on hand. Martha, this is Martha, by the way. While we're waiting for everybody to take down that number, I wondered, um, you know, we, we all watch television, movies, TV, whatever. Yes. <laughs> and we see those experiences where you end up um, someone overdosing on pills and you help them like to throw it up, to get it out of their system. Is that helpful or is that just pop culture inflaming the situation or, you know? No, that's a very good question, um, question Marley. So... It is actually no longer recommended that you um, induce vomiting in people who have uh, ingested a toxic amount of um, something that could actually harm them. It's actually recommended that you wait for the emergency response team, um, but you can give them CPR and things of that nature. But I know that it's no longer recommended that you induce vomiting in patients that have induced something. Um, that used to be something that people did, but it's no longer an appropriate action, next step. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I, if, cause it's very different from them choking 
you know, you, if you want to induce vomiting in someone who is potentially choking, that makes a difference. But if they've, um, taken something that's pretty toxic, it could actually, it's different. Okay. Um, it's no longer recommended. You would think that it still would be, but it's not. Okay. Good to know. I'm thinking it has to do with depending on what you actually have ingested. Um, it could actually harm you for it to come back up. Okay. Like maybe hurting your lungs as it's coming back mm -hmm. out. Okay. Yes, exactly. Exactly. All right. Thank you, Marley, for bringing that up. I actually had that noted to say, and I didn't say it. Oh, well, I'm very happy to have naively said that, uh, and, you know, asked the question. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. I think we have had enough time to go ahead and store that phone number. And I appreciate you guys taking the time to do that. We're going to go ahead and move on to secure storage. So whenever we're talking about secure storage, we're talking about secure storage of medicines. So my first recommendation is to store medicines in a cool, dry place. I know you've heard this before. Obviously, you wouldn't want to keep your medicines in the tub or <laughs> in the shower. Um, but I know a lot of people actually keep their medicines in the medicine cabinet in their bathroom. And though it is a very convenient place to keep it, it can actually be a very moist and harmful environment for some medicines that are very sensitive to heat. So that's something to keep in mind, maybe moving the medicine to a place that doesn't have as variable and um, changing heat versus cold, um, whereas a bathroom is one of those places. Another thing that I have here, if it requires refrigeration, store it in the refrigerator. And I think that's, that's pretty simple. Um, but the reason why I have this note is to make sure whenever you're looking at medicines to ensure that you read the label to know if it needs to be refrigerated or not as there are some newer medicines that require refrigeration that you would not know if you weren't to ask or weren't to look at the label. And we mentioned this a little bit before, but storing your medicines up high where children and pets cannot reach the medicine as well as out of sight. Um, this just really negates the risk that they would ingest it when you're not looking, because I know that it's really difficult to keep your eye on children and pets at all times, especially with the, <laughs> the energy that they have. So um, in order to not have that a high risk in your home, store it up high so that they can't reach it and they can't see it. As well as keeping these medicines in the same place. So after you take it, store it in the exact same place so you know exactly where it is. I know it's the worst feeling to feel like you might have potentially lost your medicine and you need it right now, um, or else you would be breaking your schedule. So just something to keep in mind is if you keep it in the same place, you won't forget it. And I know for people like me, when it's really hard to remember a medicine, especially if you're taking one for a shorter amount of time and it's not the one you're one of the ones you've been taking for a very long time, keeping it in the same place so that I can see it or it's a place where I have high contact throughout the day helps me to remember to take it as well. So expired, degraded, or unused medicine should be disposed appropriately. And we're gonna talk about this appropriate disposal. Reviewing medicines at least annually. So whenever I say review medicines, at least annually, I'm specifically talking about your either non-prescription medicines that you don't use very regularly. Just make sure that they're up to date so that whenever you do need to use them, that you're using an up-to-date medicine that'll actually have the effect that you want it to whenever you're taking it. And the recommendation here is once a year. So this slide is specifically talking about medicine drop-off locations. So whenever you have a medicine that is either expires, 
expired unused and has been determined by the physician that you no longer need it or degraded, you can drop it off at the nearest medicine disposal site. So the question is, where is that? Whenever looking this up, I realized that most fire stations as well as police stations tend to have a medicine disposal site and some pharmacies do, but not all pharmacies do. So that's something to keep in mind. My recommendation is in order for you to find the one that's closest to you, if you want to dispose your medicines in this format, to go ahead and Google medication disposal near me as that would help you to cater it towards your actual location. And the medi safe medication disposal boxes look a lot like this. Some of them are smaller and are actually up on the wall. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. They do look a little different depending on where you are going, um, but it's an awesome resource to have so that um, unintended medicines don't get in the hands of people that aren't supposed to have them. We're gonna talk about the home disposal of medicines. So um, we're going to first talk about some ways that you can dispose of them, but also some ways that you should not dispose of them. So for your oral medicines, you can mix them with used coffee grounds or kitty litter. I actually had a little girl once ask if um, she had to have a cat to have the kitty litter for um, <laughs> putting these oral medicines in. And I said, I don't think so, um, which I thought was funny. But yes, these are two different ways that you can get rid of those oral medicines. You can put them in coffee grounds or kitty litter. And the reason why you do this is it really just makes it unwanted from other people that might potentially be um, going through either the trash at the landfill or um, for those that are in your home and potentially have access to these medicines. Another thing is to place pills and patches in a sealed container um, so that whenever you are done with them, if they've been used or if they're expired, um, you can keep them in the sealed container and they won't come in access with people um, and put them in danger. Because I know there are some patches that can actually be harmful to people if they were to touch the wrong person, um, specifically some cancer patches. Another one is place the container in the household garbage. So this is actually not the case for all containers, but this is specifically for the oral medicines that you are going to be taking off. So you're placing all of these oral medicines in a sealed container and then putting them in the garbage. And this is after you've mixed them with coffee grounds or kitty litter. Another thing that I wanted to talk about very shortly is the drug deactivation and disposal system pouch. Some pharmacies, whenever you are given a narcotic medication like Oxycontin, um, or some other pain medicines that are considered um, narcotic medicines, they tend to give you this drug deactiv deactivation and disposal system. And you can actually ask your local pharmacy if they have something like this. But the point of this pouch is actually you put the medicines that you're not going to be using into the pouch and you add a little bit of liquid, shake it up, and it deactivates the medicines so that they can no longer be used anymore. And something that has been recommended in the past, but no longer is recommended is flushing your medicines. Do not flush medicines. And the reason why this is the case is because it's um, recommended, recommended by the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency, that we do not flush medicines. And that is because whenever you flush your medicines, they tend to get into the local water supply as well as other things um, through the spread. So it's not good to contaminate your water supply with the medicines that you're taking, especially if they can be toxic to others. Okay, so this next part is the home disposal of needles. 
So needles should not be thrown directly in the household garbage or the recycle bin. I know we had talked about putting the container that you have the oral medicines into the trash, but you should not be doing this with needles. Needles should be disposed in something called a sharps container. I actually have a picture of this in the right lower corner there. And these sharps containers should be heavy duty plastic, tight fitting, puncture proof lid, leak resistant, properly labeled, as well as in the upright position. Um, the one here on the right is actually one that you buy off of online and you, or you can buy it at some healthcare uh, like products office. But if you don't have the ability to buy one of these, you can actually use something like a laundry detergent bottle in order to keep your sharps in. As long as it's thick enough that the needles won't break through, it has the tight fitting lid, as well as it's leak resistant, and you must label it as a sharps container. Container disposal. So when this container is full, instead of putting it in the recycling bin or the trash, you should seal and reinforce the lid with duct tape or other heavy duty tapes in order to ensure that those needles do not spill out. And then when it is full, you can use a couple of ways you can dispose of it in a couple of ways. A lot of the Sharps containers actually, whenever you buy them, come with mailback programs for an extra fee. But I also know that some landfills, as well as hospitals, may accept these um, containers. When I say may, this does not mean that all landfills and hospitals will accept. You need to contact your local landfill or sanitation organization in order to ensure that they will accept it. And when I say hospitals, the hospital that you are potentially receiving care from would likely accept it if you are a patient at the healthcare system. And then if you want more information about where to uh, dispose of your container, the local health department is another place to look. Another thing that I have here is do not place the container in a recycling bin. I say it again because it has been done before. Um, if you put it in the recycling bin, it is going to be run through the recycling process and it could actually really harm someone in that process. So these are just a couple of tips for during an emergency situation that not everybody knows. It's not common knowledge, so it's something to keep in mind. We had already talked about storage of the medicines. So during an emergency situation, especially if it's a natural disaster, make sure your medicines are protected from heat, light, and moisture. In a natural disaster situation, if your power is out, make sure that those refrigerated medicines that you have are refrigerated and try and decrease the access that you have to that refrigerator or freezer as you want to keep this um, medicine cool for the next 12 to 24 hours if you decrease the access to the refrigerator. After that time, you can keep it in a cooler and um, that will be very beneficial for that. From there, you may need to contact your doctor to see what to do with your frigid, refrigerated medicines after that. In a natural disaster or in an emergency situ situation, if a medicine is damaged by the disaster, ask your doctor or pharmacist for next steps. There are some medicines that you may be able to go ahead and take it, whereas there are some other ones if it is damaged or um, misplaced, it, you should probably discontinue it. But I would talk to your doctor before discontinuing a medicine completely. And I'm sure you've heard that before from your doctor as well as your pharmacist. All right, the next one, during an emergency. So I'm actually going to be talking about briefly some of um, the law behind 90 day supplies, emergency supplies. I'm not gonna talk much about mail order, but in an emergency, a 90 day supply of a non-narcotic medicine would be beneficial if your insurance allows it. An emergency supply of medicine in the state of emergency, if necessary, 
if your insurance as well as your local pharmacy allows it, as well as mail order pharmacy if necessary. So if you're unable to get out of the home due to the emergency situation, mail order may also be another option, though not all insurance companies provide this resource. So that's just something to keep in mind. I'm mentioning it today just um, to talk about it briefly, but not everybody has access to every one of these resources. So state of emergency, what exactly is that? The state of emergency is a situation that government is empowered to put through policies that they would normally not be permitted to do for safety or protection of their citizens. Um, per Ohio state law, for those that are taking prescription medicines, those that are not narcotic medicines, um, you can be dispensed up to 30 day supply of these non-narcotic medicines with proof of a prior prescription. This is also based off of clinical knowledge of the pharmacist of you taking this medicine, as well as if it is essential for life. Um, for those narcotic medicines, according to Ohio law, you are not able to get these dispensed without a, an authorization by a doctor. So if your doctor is not in contact with the pharmacist, they are not going to be able to provide an emergency, emergency dispense of a narcotic medicine. And when I say that again, what I mean is OxyContin, some of the um, scheduled uh, psych meds, as well as um, some things of that nature. And then some medical supplies. If in an emergency your medical supplies are potentially broken or things of that nature, I would check with your insurance provider. Um, but Ohio law specifically does not limit the dispensing of medical supplies. It's solely based off of your provider as well as your insurance company coverage. Okay, so a safety net in a crisis. This is really important, especially whenever we have some pretty strange times with the emergencies that have arised recently with the COVID pandemic, as well as some of the um, weather problems that we have in Ohio. It's important to have a reliable caregiver or family member or friend who will visit or call you in a state of emergency. So if there's a problem um, where ever, a lot of people are affected by a, a certain emergency, it'd be good for you to choose a person or a group of people that are willing to call or visit you in this situation. It's also important to be prepared to quickly explain to rescue personnel or family members what you need to be healthy. So for example, in your home, be very aware of how to explain where your insulin is, where your oxygen pump is, how to um, get all your medicines so that you very quickly may leave the home in an emergency situation, as well as being familiar with the community resources. And this can include um, bus routes, as well as what the non-emergency phone number is for your police office, as well as other things. Just be aware of community resources. And as a pharmacy student and an upcoming pharmacist, I had to talk about vaccinations, specifically keeping your vaccinations current. This includes the annual influenza vaccine, the flu shot, the pneumococcal vaccine, specifically the pneumonia vaccine, which is recommended age 65 years or older, while the flu shot is actually recommended annually. So if you got a flu shot last year around this time, it's not going to cover you for this year. You have to get another flu shot. And then the zoster vaccine, which we know as the shingles vaccine, is recommended for patients age 50 or older and you can discuss all of these shots or vaccines whenever you go into a pharmacy because they can actually give all of these vaccines at your pharmacy without an appointment at a doctor's office. Okay. 
I believe this is my last content slide and it's over COVID-19. I know you guys have heard a lot about this, but I am going to discuss it very briefly just because it is the current emergency that we are in right now and it would be heavily discounting this presentation if I didn't talk about it. So for COVID-19, follow the guidelines laid out by the CDC, Ohio Department of Health, as well as other local health departments. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds and do it often. Keep six feet distance from others when possible and wear a mask covering your nose and your mouth. I know I've seen a lot of people walking around with a mask and I applaud them for wearing a mask, but you have to cover your nose for it to actually be doing what it's supposed to be doing for it to not have your breath all over everybody else. It has to cover the nose and the mouth as well as staying home if you are sick or if you think you have COVID. These are my references that I used to put together this information for this presentation today. And these are my resources for you. Since you are getting the slide deck, you can click on these. And I really thank you for listening. For any of you that actually stayed for the whole presentation, I appreciate it. Um, you made it through and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Martha. All of this information is valuable and incredibly wonderful. So thank you uh, for being with us today. If thank there are you. no other questions, I would like to say thank you to Martha and thank you, Amy, for loaning out your student to us. She's wonderful. Thank you, Jamie, for your tech support. And thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. Just FYI, we have one last webinar on Friday. And just as an FYI, too, I will, let it, I'll, I will be announcing the winner of the evacuation chair at the end of the webinar on Friday. And I will also be disclosing how we will be distributing all of the emergency readiness supplies that were identified on the flyer. So guys, go in, pick your supplies and be ready for the email asking for what you want because Jamie and I have been working hard to fill those book bags up with lots of good stuff. Um, so thank you again for everyone. Thank you for um, staying on with us a little after the time frame. I appreciate you all and I look forward to seeing you on Friday.